A punk rock band with no money for food or gas wake up with their van parked in the middle of a cornfield. As if this wasn't a bad enough omen, the band decides to earn a little more cash by taking one last gig. Their last gig is at a neo-Nazi bar on the outskirts of town. The band takes the stage, plays their punk songs, and they're ready to hit the road back home, wherever that may be. And as they're set to leave, a band member heads back to the room to grab their cell phone. Only to find instead of their cell phone, there's a woman dead on the floor surrounded by a group of men. The band has quickly locked themselves inside of a room where they must quickly decide how they will make it out of this place alive. This is It Records. Thank you. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pete, for that, that marvelous introduction. I appreciate the sound effects. That's the best I got. <laughs> okay. It's good. We'll keep it in. We'll just loop it over and over again. <laughs> Add some bass to it. Ooh, I could do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, thank you, Creatures of the Night, for joining us on the podcast today. Um, today's podcast episode, we're doing 2015 film, Green Room. Right. Yes. Okay, I'm with the Eight Rights from Washington, D.C. You guys are hard to find. Why no social media presence? Music is shared live. It's time and aggression. You gotta be there. Sorry, guys. We gotta clear out. You follow me. And then it's over. Holy shit. I told you to follow me. Stop! Go! 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 You can't keep us here and you gotta let us go. We're not keeping you, you're just staying. We're so fucking dead, guys. What do we do? Oh, shit. This will be over soon, gentlemen. So don't. It's fucking hard, man. Fifteen Green Room, directed by Jeremy Sonier. I believe it's pronounced Sonier, but it's spelled S A U L I N E R. Or maybe I'm just adding a little French, French twist to it. I'll, I'll let you decide. Is he French? Is he is he French? I believe he is, um, or at least has French heritage, because there's also um, one of the actors in this film who plays Gabe is Macon Blair. And I believe he's has, I think he's French as well, or French heritage. He's in a lot of Jeremy's films. He's in a lot of his earlier works. Jeremy was born in the U.S., and that's all I could really find about him. So, so maybe he's not French, but that is, I believe, <clears throat> how you pronounce his name. He could be Somewhere. French descent. Did you say scent? Descent, you know. <laughs> oh, he is, he is of, oh, French descent. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So I'm not. I mean, I don't know. Name. I just. <laughs> I. <laughs> yeah. I just said he could be. I don't know. Oh, he could be. Okay, I thought you found maybe. Yeah. His uh, what is it? Twenty three and Me or whatever. <laughs> biography of his DNA. His, yeah, his you know. History. I got. I got the ancestry dot com right here. <laughs> Perfect. Glad we cleared that up. Well, for those of you who don't know of Green Room at all, um, which you might not have heard of it, Green Room is a 2015 horror film. That's for starters. Uh, but <laughs> but it, it follows a punk rock band who is forced to fight for survival after witnessing a murder at a neo-Nazi skinhead bar. Basically, what you picked up from the crawl, or from the beginning, my little intro at the beginning. That is the setup for the film. And I'm not sure if you guys knew this, but it's part of a loose trilogy for Jeremy Sonier. I did not know that. Yeah, so I think I mentioned to, not on the podcast, but to you guys at some point, 
that I was going to watch the film <clears throat> Murder Party, which is also done by Jeremy Sonier. And that's part of this loose trilogy that he's made, and it's dubbed either the Inept Protagonist Trilogy or the Clusterfuck Trilogy, I've heard it called. I like the Clusterfuck uh, Trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> and that includes Murder Party, Green Room, and this other one called Blue Ruin. Where it's I've seen that one. Blue, okay, you've seen Blue Ruin. I have. Uh, it apparently just follows a bunch of protagonists who are inept or make silly, dumb decisions in situations that are kind of thrust upon them. Okay. So they have that. I wonder if he's going... All in common, but they're not connected otherwise. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. There's no, like, character or storyline. It's just... The, it's a, a loose trilogy of characters who are they make terribly dumb decisions in irrational settings. Right on. I, I wonder if he's kind of going off the vibe of like, you know how like John Carpenter has like a loose trilogy with his like uh, movies. Um, God, I can't remember which ones they are, but I know. Um, oh God. Anyways. I forgot what they were. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, Dario, Dario Gento kind of has it, too. Was it Three Witches, uh, or is that what it's called? Yeah, let's say Cattle Nine Tails, I think, is in that one. And Inferno, and probably Phenomena or something. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Inferno, it, is it Deep Red? I don't think Deep Red's a part of that. Okay. I thought Inferno there, was. Inferno, I believe, is, but is there something with, like, the crystal plumage? Is that him? I... Yeah, he did that one, too. Yeah. Uh, but I believe that is... The Animal Trilogy is The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, The Cat of Nine Tails, oh. and Four Files on Grey Velvet. Three Mothers by him is Suspiria, Inferno, and The Mother of Tears. Ah, uh, so he's got okay. two. So he's got two. Yeah. Yeah. I know John Carpenter has at least one, and then, like... The one with Sam Neill is a part of that. Mm-hmm. Wait, the vampire movie with Sam Neill? Of... No, oh. not vampire. No. Oh, okay. What? What vampire movie? With Sam Neill? Isn't he in that one with uh, oh, Ethan thinking... Hawke? Is that like Daywalkers or something? Isn't that a movie? He's not in that. I swear he's to God in he's in that movie. No. Sam... Pause. Okay, Everybody Sam pause Neill... the podcast. I'm checking it out. No, no. Oh, it is going on the podcast. Sam Neill... Isn't a weird movie called Possession, oh. but it's not a vampire movie. Sam Neill's also in the, in the Mouth of Madness. Okay. That's directed by John Carpenter. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I'm talking about cause... Daybreakers, not Daywalkers, with Ethan Hawke, and he is in that movie. <laughs> is he really? He's on the cover of the movie, yeah. I. That's right, Alan Grant is in that movie. <laughs> okay. Me <laughs> I love Dr. Alan Grant. <laughs> yeah, I think we all do. Let's take a moment to really recognize Dr. Alan Grant. <laughs> whose side tangent is going to be in the new Jurassic World. Yes. I'm very excited about the three of them coming back. Yeah. But speaking of coming back, Green Room. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's get back to the green, green Room this week. It's got uh, Yantan Yelchnik. I don't know how to say his name. <laughs> That Anton guy. Yelchin? Yeah, that guy. Yeah, um, he plays Pat. He's in it. Um, from Star Trek, uh, the remake of Fright Night as well. That's true. I, f- yeah. I forgot he was in that. Yeah, he's the lead in it. Man, I, I haven't seen that movie in a while. I did not remember What year that. was yeah. that? 2011? I remember. Uh, that sounds about right. That sounds right. Huh. Yeah. I remember David Tennant was in it. That's all I really remember. David Tennant and like Colin Farrell, I think. Yeah, Colin Farrell was the the, the vampire next door. That's a good trio of actors to be in a remake. Yeah. <laughs> well, we mentioned uh, Anton Yelchin's in this movie. Um, there's some other actors you may be familiar with. Joe Cole's in it, Callum Turner. But Ali Shawkat is in the film. Aaliyah Shawkat, who plays Maybe in Arrested Development. Yes. If you're familiar with that. Oh my god, yeah. She's one of the bassist in the punk rock band. The Ain't Rights is the name of the, their punk rock band. And, of course, you'll probably remember Patrick Stewart. Patrick Stewart plays Darcy in this film. Er, antagonist. How the hell, how the hell did they get Patrick Stewart to be in this I'll film? I'll tell you that in my uh, trivia later on. Oh, uh, 
Awesome. Oh, shit. Wow, wow. Cool. All right. Well, we can kind of launch into the film now that you got the, the basic setup for it. Um, it starts off, how I mentioned in the, in the crawl, is that you have this punk rock band made up of these, uh, you know, there's what, five members, or no, four members, and we see them the first time that they're introduced to us, they're asleep, right, in this van, in the middle of a cornfield? Yep. Now, how did you guys perceive that? I was curious, did you think that they purposely were in that cornfield, or, like, they were trying to hide out, or they, like, crashed into the cornfield at night? I don't know. I was just glad that I wasn't them. Mm. I think, I think what they're, they're trying to be punk rock, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're trying to stick it to the man by sleeping in the cornfield, not paying for hotel rates. Exactly. And they're like, they're a band, they don't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Boom. Yeah. That's my You're answer. right on the money, I Yeah. Think a good answer because the, they wake up the next day and they go immediately to siphon gas out of these out of a car i think it was like a grocery store parking lot because they're out of gas because they were running the gas was running all night they were in the van and the car was running all night yeah stupid fucking punk kids yeah. come on that immediately like left a sour taste in my mouth look with these characters just saying yeah, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that's a, a thing I've learned doing research on this, like, trilogy with these characters is he never really wrote them that they're, like, likable or you're rooting for them, really. Um, they're not, You don't dislike them all that much, but you don't really care for them. They're just kind of, you know, whatever. I agree. And that, that's, like, that's an intent purpose from Jeremy Sonier when he writes these characters out. Okay, well, he succeeded in that, then. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, because they're kind of, they're really chaotic, they have no structure, and they go from, you know, siphoning the gas to meeting up with this kind of quote-unquote reporter, right, who's supposed to be like, I don't know if he runs a local punk radio or magazine, um, and he's doing an interview with them before they're supposed to do a gig um, that they were going to get some money for, but that gig gets turned down or it wasn't going to happen. So the guy feels bad about it. But in in that interview, we learn a lot about who these ain't rights are, the punk rock musicians, and that they don't really have any money. They don't really have a plan. They have no direction. They're kind of just going gig to gig, and music is just their life, and it's all spontaneous to them. It's punk, punk rock. They're not they on live in the punk rock either. life. That's right, not on social. Huge, like foreshadow for a horror movie is like we're not on social media so no one's gonna find us if we go missing exactly. we don't use our cell phones ever we're yeah which then sets us up to basically this guy wants to get them a gig because he feels bad for him says i it's my cousin i think he said knows of this bar doesn't he doesn't call them neo-nazis but he says they're they're not really political but stick to your early stuff I think is what he says with their music. Stick to your early stuff. Um, like, don't go off script. Does it, but kind of sets the stage that these guys are kind of rough. But if they want a gig, there's this bar they can go play some music at. And so, of course, these kids need the cash, and they take off to this bar in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the woods somewhere. <laughs> Sorry. Fine I was enough. checking my... I look. Well, I was looking through my notes real quick, <laughs> and I like come up. And he's got a full plate of pizza, and he's just chowing down. <laughs> yeah, wasn't expecting that. I've had this the whole time. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but that, that's kind of the setup for the movie, and they get to this this bar, and they realize it's a neo-Nazi bar based on all the graffiti that you see kind of on the walls and the. The people that are there, um, it's never really explicitly told to you. Um, that this is like a neo-Nazi bar, but you pick up on it from who were there and the space, really the, the bar space, which is another thing that Jeremy Sonier does in his movies is he doesn't like exposition, which is giving people the details of a story like 
through long dialogue and scenes that are just like setting up the movie. He says he doesn't like it and he wants to, the people and their dialogue should sell the story. And like that should move it along. You should figure out who they are. And that's how he wants to do his movie. So that's kind of how we pick up that they're in this neo-Nazi bar is actually getting there and seeing it for ourselves as the audience, as the viewer. Then they get on stage and they play. And did you guys, you guys familiar with the song they chose to play in the bar at all? Um, it was some cover, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was like, uh, oh my God. It's probably like a famous punk band too, and I can't Neither. remember. But is it the Dead Kennedys? Dead Kennedys. Is it the Dead Kennedys? Yep. Um, it's like, fuck Nazi or something. I can't remember. It's something along I, those lines. Like, Yep. I believe it's Nazi punks fuck off is the title of the song by the Dead Kennedys. And that's what they chose to sing uh, <laughs> as their first track at this bar. So just from that, you can kind of already tell that these guys have no structure. They go to this bar and they thought it'd be funny to play that as their first song at this bar. So they really don't have any care for their any, any consequences that could come from their actions. Yeah. And then the inciting incident that ends Act 1, I think, into Act 2 is after the show they're going to leave and one of the actors, one of the bandmates goes to get her phone and there was a dead body on the floor. And now they're a witness to a murder and they get locked in a room and basically, it's trying to figure out what to do next. That's the setup, at least. Yeah. Yeah, shit, shit got real, real fast. Hey. <laughs> Sorry. It's just them being locked in the room and then fighting and, like, just trying to survive, like, the entire time. Yeah. Essentially, that's all it is. And that, that's the introduction of, of Darcy, which is Patrick Stewart. I don't think he is not a part of any of the bar until the murder happens. Is he the owner of the bar? I kind of got that. Is, if not the owner of the bar, he's the, the leader of this organization, of whatever they are. Okay. Because even... Nazis? Of these Nazis group, yeah. Like... Because next to the bar is like this little, I don't know, shed house area where this other guy is like counting stacks of money and like really taking account of, you know, what's going down. And he learns about it and it's very bureaucratic of like, it, it, it's, a, it's a juxtaposition of these kids who are these punks who have no structure to like the Nazis who are like, it needs to go through this chain of command. And I think it's a front. Isn't it basically a front in the bar? They're probably selling drugs. It was heroin, right? I thought they they might have mentioned heroin. I couldn't remember. Yeah. Probably. I th- I thought Patrick Stewart said they were like running heroin and they needed to like clean up what was going on with this murder and these witnesses really quick, get it over with. But the, he had a whole plan laid out. Okay. He was re- like they had done this before almost. So his first rodeo. Yeah. Patrick Stewart as a bad as a bad guy is a uh, pretty scary. Yeah, he He's sells it well. <laughs> yeah, I think what like makes him even the more so terrifying is it, you have the kids who are like completely have no idea what like any structure or, or any plan to get out of there, and this chaotic situation happens, and he's just so calm about it. Where he's like, this is what you need to do. Don't talk back to me. Do this. Talk to this guy. Talk, go talk to Worm. Um, go set up a witness. Get a true believer. Um, we'll call the cops. And he's just so measured. Um, which he, He's not like greater than, larger than life. But just his, his very little structure in this like total chaotic space is what makes him even more terrifying. Agreed. That, I was going to say, that's what makes him the most scary is that how calm he is. Like, he's done this a million times. Yeah. I mean, he fought Magneto for all those years. He knows what's up. Yeah, he's not scared of a little punk rock band in his <laughs> bar. <laughs> is there anyone that, like, 
stuck out in this movie for you besides Patrick Stewart or what would you say? I don't even like Patrick Stewart was was good. I don't know if he like transcended everybody else. I thought most people did a pretty good job. Every mm-hmm. everybody's performance was I don't know pretty comparable. I thought for like the the role they were in and they did a good job of selling it even from like just the guitarist and the drummer and the band um, their role I thought they played well they didn't go above and beyond mm-hmm. and so you know we get back and forth that they're just trying to get out of this room and negotiate how to get out did you guys ever think that they were going to be left out alive they were going to be let go because they negotiated that. They said, hey, just give us the gun. XYZ will let you go. We called the cops. You'll be fine. Just, we have the car running. Did you ever believe, like, Patrick Stewart, or did you think that they were always going to kill them? Not for a second did I think that all of them would be getting out. <laughs> Fair. He, I, I also agree, but I also feel like he brought out his charm, Patrick Stewart, and I was just like, oh, if I was there, I would have fell for it. I would have, I would have. <laughs> I probably have to, no doubt. Yeah. Well, there's that scene that where Anton Yelchin basically is is giving into the Stuart charm, and he he's gonna give him the gun because they have the gun with them inside. He's like, all right, I'll give you the gun, and he hands it outside the door. And that scene also, I think, is one of the grossest scenes of the movie, where it doesn't shy away from the gore, yeah. where they're like. I don't know what they were doing to his arm, but it was like lodged in the door as his bandmates were trying to pull him back in and the Nazis were trying to pull him back out, but they were like cutting and stabbing up his arm. Yeah, like massive attack. So yeah. Yeah, so when they pull back in, it's just like a mangled mess. Oh. Yeah, it was gross. It was very gross. Yeah. I think that's when it, it really took it to the level that these guys aren't going to make it out alive and it's not going to be pretty the way they get out of this. Because then they duct taped his arm to like suture it back up, which really <laughs> made me cringe. And I was like, that might help for now, but that's gonna hurt. If you make it out of here, that's gonna hurt like a bitch to get off. That's gonna be so bad. Oh. That's what morphine is for. <laughs> I get, yeah. Well, I mean, that's the whole point. These are inept protagonists making dumb decisions, so. Let's hand him back the gun. We have a gun, let's give it back. These Nazis seem very reasonable. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Like, what's her name? Aaliyah Shawcat's character, when she sees the woman dead for the first time in the room, she just says, like, well, maybe she's not really dead. And the one guy laughs at her. Like, that's the thought process that we're working with with our main characters. It's like she has a, <laughs> like a razor bla- uh, a box cutter in her head, and she's like, well, maybe she's just, like, knocked out or something. <laughs> no. She's definitely not. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what do you think that girl did to get herself killed? I think she was trying to get out of the organization, right? Is that what it was? I read that. I, I didn't think. come to that conclusion while watching. Oh, so, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, I think that was, it was more like, it was more implicit. Like, I think, because her friend who was alive was in the room with the bandmates as well. Um, I think we're kind of led to believe that she, she was trying to get out or away from these people to some degree. And then they didn't want her to, so they, they killed her. She was too valuable to the organization. Which, we get these scenes in the movie where they finally try to bust out of the green room, right? Which is where they're... St- that's where they're stuck in. Hence the name of the movie, okay? Green Room. Um, they are trapped in a green room. Now, do you guys know the significance of like what a green room is? In like, yes. Okay. Spell it I'm out. I'm sure you, you, you work for Blumhouse, so you, you get it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is an A24 movie, not Blumhouse. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, Pete, you can, you can explain it if you want. Green Room is like where, like, act, I guess, like, for theater talk to it's like where actors like kind of like lounge and like kind of like they could get ready there too but like that's more of just kind of like a place to chill 
when they're not playing or whatever, right? That's there's another name for it, but a green room is a common name for it. <clears throat> yeah, exactly, and that's what it means. That's what it means in this movie. Like, that's where the murder happened. That's where they're stuck. Is the room where they were chilling at before and after the show. That's where all their gear was, um, and now they're locked in there. Um, but then back to the story, they they finally try to break out of there, but they're they're basically immediately pushed right back into the green room. Like, they try to break out, but the Nazis are so... Neo-Nazis are so prepared. Like, they have the place surrounded and, like, booby-trapped, almost. So these people, it seems like they can never get out. And they're pushed back in several times, um, which leads to the deaths of some of the bandmates. Oh. <laughs> Cats. Which I, I wanted then to bring to the finale... Which is, you know, this whole kind of movie is the dichotomy between order, if you'll say, like the neo-Nazis, who have some structure. Like, they're not going to break from this. Um, and this band, which is like, anarchy, we're punk, we don't have structure or anything. And they just, they kind of, they're just, they rush out. They literally leave the green room one time and go, fuck it. And they, they run out with like a light bulb, like an LED light. They're not LED, but like a T12 light bulb and like the box cutter and they just like kind of run and two of them get killed one by a dog and one by the neo-nazis and so the order is taking up taking over the chaos but eventually they get out with the same strategy it's just like chaos but it's structured chaos where anton yeltsin's character has this paintball story do you guys remember the, the paintball story from this movie slightly he, I vaguely remember it. He, he mentions it like twice in passing to start. He's like, oh, you know what we should do is that the paintball story. And they're like, shut up. <laughs> shut up about paintball. We don't care. But when they're about to die, him and the it's other girl. stupid. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to play paintball. <laughs> we're, we're trying to get out of here. But he, he finally tells a story at the end, which was saying they went to a, like a paintball arena, and it was just them and a couple of their buddies, and they were paired up. The other team they had to play was like these ex-Marines from Iraq. And they were like so organized. And they just like demolished these people. Like they were demolishing their friends. And they were just getting sick and tired of it. They couldn't do anything. And they were just like getting pelted. But then, then finally one of his friends, what he decided to do was he just like gave up. He didn't give a shit. That he like stormed their base. And they were like pelting him. And he just went in and just kept firing at them. <laughs> And just kept shooting and shooting and didn't give up, even though he was getting shot with paintballs the whole time. So that's the paintball story, to which they applied that to getting out of the green room. They knew they were overmatched the whole time. So they really had, you know, no plan, but the, it was still chaos of, like, you know, luring the people in. But it was just a little bit structured to like fool the neo-nazis to like bring them into this corner of the room and then we attack so they just learn that they can't be always going off the cuff if they're going to make it out of here but they don't have to completely change insight pull green room <laughs> how would you describe the third act Lindsay usually uh, you take that yeah, um, helm so <clears throat> Toward the end, we've got Pat, uh, Ant and Yelchin's character, and then the um, Emily, the girl that uh, was killed, her friend Amber. They're the last two that remain. Um, so I think um, Darcy sends like two more skinheads to try to kill them, but um, this is when Pat and Amber overtake them in the drug lab, and... Um, I think Amber kills Kyle, the first skinhead, with a box cutter, and then she shoots Jonathan. Um, so they both die. And then Amber and Pat kind of take their journey through the woods while holding um, Gabe at gunpoint. Um, after he surrenders to them, they kill everybody, including, including Darcy. And then uh, kind of the end, they're just sitting there and waiting for the police to arrive. In... I've... I thought there were two pretty interesting scenes in that third act. One, where like you, you said, they're they're waiting there to kind of die at the end after they've killed Darcy and the other neo-Nazi characters. What, do you guys do you guys remember what 
Anton Yeltsin says at the very end, his last line. I, 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 I've, li- I've actually forgot if you remember it. It's, I don't think remember. it's like, tell someone who gives a shit or something. That's right. Okay. That's right. It's something like, he's like, it, there's something about like the paintball story or like something about punk rock. And he was like, yeah, well, tell someone who gives a shit. And yeah. like, like, he's like over it. Like, it was something yeah. that he, he had said in the beginning. He's like, I don't care anymore. And it was good that it ends just like green room. And the credits roll up. <laughs> <laughs> But also in that there was a moment of, I thought, humor in the film when uh, I believe his name's Gabe, which is played by Macon Blair, who's in a lot of Jeremy Sonier's films. Uh, he's in Blue Ruin. He's the lead in it. He's one of the neo-Nazis who's kind of on the fence, I feel like, of what they're doing. But he's he's kind of seen as like, I don't know, he has some hum- humanity to him. But in this scene at the end, he believes that the guys have gone in and killed the punk punk rock group. So he's going in with like a, a shop vac or whatever. And he's starting to clean up the place and like power wash down the blood and all that. And so. like really clean up the bar so they could open it up the next day. Yes. I thought that it was a funny scene when he's just like, he's like this like posing down the wall. And Anton Yelchin and the, the female um, actress who's alive, I think it's Emojin Poots. Um, she's alive. And they're like out. They come out with the shotgun and the machete, and they're just like pointing it at him. And he slowly like turns off, uh, like the pressure washer. Mm. It's like, oh shit! Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is not how it's supposed to happen. Yeah, that was a nice. That was a nice little funny moment for sure. Yeah. It's a really suspenseful film. I thought throughout, just constant. Like uneasiness throughout the entire yeah. Movie. You had some trivia for us, Lindsay. Yeah. Burr, burr. Okay. <laughs> so, um, the first <clears throat> word and the last word of the film are both the same, and uh, uh, that's shit, as we uh, covered a couple minutes ago. So, just a little bookend yeah. trivia for you. Um. Moving on to Sir Patrick Stewart being in this movie. So I'm uh, referencing IMDb with uh, this, but he said that once he finished reading the script, um, he was so terrified that he locked up his house and turned on his security system and then poured himself a scotch. And um, it was that moment that he says that he knew he wanted to play the Darcy role because the character character was so scary that it would be an incredible challenge and make for a compelling movie as far as he was concerned. So I guess that's all it took. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, one last uh, little piece nugget for you um we've got some red boost boot laces laces that they refer to a couple times in the movie um so i guess um no the first time it was for people that were allowed to know what was going on and then once somebody earned their red laces so to speak um you know that's when they got them um but the red boot lace color was an important um, signal in the skin, skinhead culture because um, it indicated that the wearer had shed blood um, for the skinhead organization. So um, the racist skinheads will often randomly attack non-whites to earn their laces. So that's a little dark. Yeah, and mm. that must have been what, I mean, they referenced it, but those two two men who were part of the setup that you know, Darcy called the police and said there was a stabbing, not a murder, but a stabbing. And he said, I think to get two true believers, who are these two guys, and one guy got stabbed, like with a short little knife. Um, and that must have been like what they're referencing with the red laces, is that was him earning his, his laces. He was going to take those stab wounds, go to the hospital and say that he was stabbed mm-hmm. for the organization so they could hide the, hide the body. Interesting tidbit. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. So if you didn't know, now you know. That's my super short show. I don't know why that <laughs> <laughs> popped in my head. Whatever happened to him? I don't know. I no... He got tall. <laughs> and it became a really long show. And they got to cut it from here. 
<laughs> it turned. It got six minutes. It turned into six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I know I do this, and I, I'll, I'll do it right now since we've done trivia um, before we do like defend or destroy. But the significance where it kind of falls in the horror genre, I think it hits a lot of different subgenres. It could be considered a really, you know, psychological thriller that we've done. Um, it has that. The horror elements of being that secluded spot, out of your element, um, um, being kind of cornered in an isolated location, which is, you know, that's a horror. You have the body horror, the body violence of people being. There's some pretty intense scenes I feel like in this movie of, yeah, of Gork from the that his poking his hand through the door to when the dog attacked the throat of one of the, the bandmates was pretty yeah. intense. Um, but also with any, like, good horror, there's, like, kind of that social critique, if you will, of what's going on at the time. And um, so they're really kind of casting a light on, you know, maybe, like, neo-Nazi alt-right movements at the time, <laughs> today, uh, of what's going on um, in society. Um, that's kind of prevalent. And to that extent, I found something in the research of elevated horror have you guys heard of that in terms of like a subgenre? No. I, I hadn't either. Um, but like kind of what it was described as is elevated horror is referring after 9-11. So after 2001, they were saying a lot of horror movies that were like original and they weren't remakes. Um, they started making them where it wasn't one villain, like a Mike Myers or a Jason or something like that, um, because it wasn't enough like the dangers in the world that these kids saw growing up seemed like they would seem bigger than that. They seemed like it had to be an organization or a larger social global issue. So when you would make a scary horror movie, you could have like a Darcy in this movie who's kind of the leader, but it's really the group of the neo-Nazis at the bar that is the villain. And it's like a larger social issue or a larger social group that would go beyond just uh, this one bar. And so that was a, a term that was coined elevated horror for movies after 9-11. So I thought that was kind of know. an interesting take on it. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. Definitely have not noticed that at all, but it's... I'll... Well, like, they, they put even Jordan Peele's movies in there, like Get Out and um, Us are... Yeah. It has a, a sole person you're kind of looking at as the villain, but it's a larger group and a larger social for context. For sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, do you guys have any more uh, trivia or tidbits uh, to give before we do like a Monster in the Closet or Defender Destroy? I probably do our budget. I, I, oh, yes, yes, yes. Take it away, Pete. Oh. Uh, I'm gonna fifteen million. Okay. Budget. Um. Forty five box office. I I I don't. I think I know the numbers off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't a success. Like I think it flopped, like toward the budget. Oh yeah, I think you're right. I think it did. Like I mean, I, I know it's yeah. ninety percent on Rotten Tomatoes, and it's gotten critical reception. But I think it. It, it technically flopped to our standards of like making his money back. I think it was a big, oh yeah, I think it was a big like video on demand movie. Yeah. So like the box office probably wasn't very good. Yep. Yeah, so it's, so you said, what, 15 mil budget? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Lindsay, do you, do you know the numbers by chance? Um, I think I know budget. I, Okay. I have them up here. Do you want to take a stab at it? Yeah, I think it was estimated to be $5 million, But I don't know the box office number. You're dead on. It's a $5 million budget. And it only made $3.8 million. Whoa. Oh. Yeah. That's Which rough. It's funny. It's not, a, yeah, it's not a commercial success. But every review I've heard about it, or like people who have said I've seen it, I feel like I've said they enjoyed it and thought it was good. They just must not have seen it when it was initially released. And now it's on Netflix. So that's where I, I viewed it. 
And people are just kind of watching it after the fact that it's come out. Yeah. Because I don't remember it coming around into theaters. Not at all. Maybe that's just me, but I don't remember seeing it anymore. Now that you said it wasn't, like, a box office success, it was, like, a big video on-demand movie. Like, I think, like, that was, like... That's been kind of, like, a trend lately with a lot of horror movies that, like, can't get, like, a wide release. They, uh, they're, like, same day, like, on-demand or whatever. Okay. Same day theater, whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Like, they have, like, a very select theater, and then you could, like, rent it, like, off whatever platform you use I have okay I have one sad trip one darker trivia I guess um, this was Anton Yelchin's last theatrical release yeah that's, that's true sad. rest in peace he's super passed. sad yeah yeah I believe it was the following year that he um, was killed in an accident right yeah yeah a freak accident. Ugh. Wasn't he? He was pinned right to his garage door. So. Yeah, his own. He was going. He got out of his car, and I, I'm. I haven't looked at the details in a while, but I believe he got out of his car and he's like going to get the mail or something or to open his garage door, and he must have put the car in like neutral and not park or something, or it was still in drive when he got out, and it just kind of rolled forward and pinned him. That's what I thought happened. Sad. But he's great in this movie. He's good. Yeah. I've, I've always really enjoyed him and everything. His character was the only one I cared about in this movie. I keep confusing him and, like, Elijah Wood for being in this movie, and I don't that know why. That looks because they look similar. Yeah, they do. They have a similar look. Mm-hmm. Very similar. Short, smaller guys. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, uh, Matt, would you defend or destroy this movie? I would full heartedly. I like the, I defend it. I like this movie a lot. Uh, it's actually my first time viewing it. I've actually since watched Murder Party, which was on, which is another one of Jeremy's, um, on Netflix, and I really mm-hmm. like that as well. I need to see Blue Ruin, but I, I really enjoyed Green Room. I, I was kind of like not super excited about it just because of, like the premise I thought might be oh I've seen this movie before or it seems like it might be you know just uh, I don't know too I, I don't know I, I'd seen the movie before like you know they go to a bar they get stuck there it's neo-nazis is it gonna be just like a big gore fest or a torture movie and it was it was surprisingly not that it was surprisingly realistic I felt like of what the people would do in that situation like they made dumb decisions but I mean what you would do if that happened to you when you were stuck in that room, I feel like we would, fuck it, let's just get out of here. And then you get stuck and you have to like replan and figure out because you were lost. And I, it it kept a good pace the whole time. And it was only an hour and a half long, so it doesn't drag it on. So I I defend it. I really like Green Room. Nice. Lindsay? Okay, so... <laughs> There's lots of gore and action in this movie. It throws you some curveballs, you know. And uh, honestly, like I said, I don't really care a whole lot for the characters except for maybe Pat. And um, I didn't find it very interesting. And, uh, (laughs) you know, really, I would say it's kind of a middle-of-the-road pick for me. But since that's not an option, um, we're going to go with Destroy. It kind of just falls flat for me with the dialogue and um, the acting. So, destroy. Like, I feel bad right. saying that for some reason. But <laughs> <laughs> I just, I didn't like it enough to defend it. So, there we go. That's fine. That's fine, yeah. That is your, that is your decision. <laughs> decided. Here's, here's the thing. I actually very much agree okay, with Lindsay. I feel a little better. <laughs> I'm also going to destroy this movie. Um, It's not bad. It's really not a bad movie. I think... I think when when I first watched it, it was like getting a lot of kind of hype, I would say. Because uh, maybe I just... Maybe I let the Rotten Tomatoes reviews kind of cloud my, du- my judgment. Mm-hmm. And I just remember being like, okay, this is like fine. 
And then, then, like, I remember being annoyed with, like, the characters, thinking they were dumb. And not really caring about any characters. And I don't know why I always think of, like... Like, the guy doing, like, the arm bar or whatever. Like, like he's, like, into... He's, like, thinks he's all cool because he, like, knows some UFC moves. I don't know. It really bothered me. <laughs> but, yeah. I don't like it. <laughs> well, with that, I think that's two destroys and one defend for green room. And that's 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 it. That's that's it for the show. I was trying to think what I usually do, but yeah, two two <laughs> destroys and a defend um, for green. You room. say like I remain in the shadows. That's what you say, right? But I I feel like I had some spiel, and it's just basically check us out on Facebook, on yeah. uh, SoundCloud. We're on there. You can find us on Apple. Listen to us. Let us know what you're thinking. If you want us to do a certain mini episode or full-length episode, um, let us know. You can watch this one on Netflix if you have it. Otherwise, you can rent it anywhere. Um, you can digitally rent movies, but it's on Netflix if you have it. <laughs> um, and also, Murder Party by this director, but I don't think Blue Ruin is on Netflix. I'm not, I'm not sure if it is. That truly is used, used to be. Used to be. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But until then, I am Matt Johnson. Now I'm in the shadows. I'm Peter Hansen, and that's all, folks. 